Hi everyone and welcome to Containers and Container Management. Today we are going to be talking about the advantages and disadvantages of containers such as Docker. We're going to be able to identify and describe reasons we might use a container and implement one. And we are also going to talk about how to use and implement container management software such as Kubernetes. Last time we talked about virtualization, which was the idea of being able to make a virtual computer. Now containers are sort of related to that. When we talked about virtualization, we were talking about basically the ability to have multiple computers on one set of hardware. Containers are very similar in that we can have multiple setups on one set of hardware, but one of the things that makes them different is rather than emulating the entire other computer, we are able to emulate just the part that we need. So a container is an isolated place on your machine. One of the common ways that you'll see this described is think of shipping. So if you have shipping containers and you have basically boxes on a ship, what we're trying to do is have standard sized boxes so that we can fit them easily on our ship so that it can go places. So in this particular case, we're trying to make the shipping easier and cheaper. So rather than having the operating system and the software and the hardware as part of the box, we can just ship the pieces we need, the code and the dependencies. So it's one of the ways that we are able to, I guess I would say streamline some of the things that we're doing. It means that we're able to implement things using less resources. So we can actually have more things on one single piece of hardware. Containers are actually incredibly popular in industry and you're probably using them all the time without realizing it. Every time you're using Google, such as Gmail or Search or something, you're actually using a container. That's what's happening in the background. Now, containers are useful and one of the things that makes them really useful is we can ensure that our setup is what you are going to see. So like for example, one of the things that can happen a lot in computers is the, well, but it worked on my machine. Now containers can actually fix some of that because if the container is set up correctly, we can guarantee that that's going to work. So as long as you can get the container running, then you know that container is going to work the way that we want it to. So like if I am developing something and you want to run the thing that I have made, I can ensure that you running it is going to be easier and more streamlined if I set it up in a container. Microservices will break applications into smaller parts so teams can more easily work on things. We can also have more guaranteed re reproducibility because if I am able to set up my container correctly, anybody that implements my container will be able to have exactly what I want them to have. It also helps with isolation by keeping our applications separated so that we aren't going to run into conflicts and dependency issues. Repositories for the containers will actually give us these pre-made containers. Something else that actually makes containers really helpful is that they're easily disposable and quick to work with. They're basically really cheap. So if we go back to our box analogy, so if we have a ship that we want to use to be able to send items to the end user, we want to make sure that the ship is packed as efficiently as possible. So we're going to want to use these boxes to be able to send things to people. And we want these boxes to have the same size so that they are easier to pack together. And that also means that when I'm sending it, I know that I'm sending you a, you know, let's say two by two box, you know you're receiving a two by two box, so it makes it easier on everybody's end. And then whatever you can pack into that two by two box is really up to the people doing the creation. Containers are actually also really useful because it's really easy to rebuild those boxes. So if something goes wrong, all of those boxes are really easy to take down and rebuild repeatedly. Now, 
containers versus virtual machines. The big difference here. The container is going to have the programs and the libraries, whereas the virtual machine is going to have the programs, the libraries, and the kernel. So on our machine, if we picture just like a regular tower, that's going to have an operating system that you'll interact with. If we have a virtual machine, we're going to have a piece of software such as VMware VirtualBox or something else, KVM, whatever. That's going to create an entire separate virtual machine and it's going to have basically pretend software, pretend hardware, and a pretend operating system. If I'm using a container, instead of having to have fake hardware and fake software and a fake operating system, I am actually able to just have the thing that I want. And so the container is able to have a smaller amount of information in it. So like when you create a virtual machine, you'll notice that they're going to be, you know, um, like if you download an image, you might be seeing a two, four, five gig image. But if you have a container, it's actually probably going to be considerably smaller than that. And it could be in the megabytes instead of gigabytes, depending on the container. Now, container options. So this is as of 2022. The container market is very popular. Tons and tons of people use them in industry. It's a really good job skill to have. Um, the changes in the market actually haven't been sort of huge. It's five years ago, containers were starting to become more popular, but now they're sort of, they're here. So um, Docker is actually currently the most popular. It's got about 81% of market share. So what you'll see actually really commonly is projects that'll say the Docker way to build things. Um, Kubernetes has about 13% of market share. Kubernetes is not the same as Docker, and we're going to talk a little bit about the differences in a minute, but Docker is container software, and Kubernetes is container orchestration, and they're slightly different. Most of the other container options um, are there, and some people use them, but they mostly have less than 2% of market share. So we're going to mostly be focusing on Docker and Kubernetes as the most popular ones. Um, but you can see this, well, image of a very, you know, sad chip. Um, all of those boxes you can think about as like, those are the containers that we're working on. And hopefully they will not look as sad as the ship in the meme. Now, container images. When we talk about a container, we have the box that we're trying to build. That box has a recipe, very much like you would see in a kitchen. It's a set of instructions on how we build that box. Once we have built that box, a, a literal like sort of picture of what that box is supposed to look like can be hosted places so that other people can take a copy of our box, assuming we've done everything correctly. So a container registry is where we can basically host all of these images of our boxes so that other people can see copies of them. We can have public, private, or third-party registries. Now, a really popular one is actually Docker Hub. That's one of the most popular ones. And that's where a lot of people will host the official image. And again, image, you can think of it just like a picture of our box. One of the things that makes containers really awesome is we can actually have a repository or a place to store all of our containers. It's a collection of containers. And we can actually do collections based on tags. We could do collections based on, you know, other things as well. For example, we could have the Python repository. We could have a Docker um, and this is both examples, Docker Hub, because it's the most popular, but like we could have a Docker container of Apache, the web server. So we can actually go follow this link and have the official Python or the official Apache container, which is an image of exactly what the developers want us to have. So we can see sort of, this is the perfectly implemented box. And instead of us having to follow the instructions to make that box, what we can actually do is say, you know, actually, I'm just going to take a copy of that box, photocopy it over here for me, and then you can start using it. So rather than having to go through, you know, sort of building the box and making changes to it yourself, you can just take that image and run it. 
and they'll usually have instructions for that as well, which is really nice. Now, Docker is container software. It's technically open source, but there is a little bit of a if here. Docker has been moving a little bit more closed source. They are trying to find their profit model. And so that means while it is true that they are still technically open source, there are some things in Docker that you can end up paying for, especially in enterprise. So it is worth making sure that you are careful what it is that you are doing and what it is that you're setting up so that you aren't accidentally doing something you don't want to be. So Docker is our very, very popular container software. It's a way for us to run applications. Everything is considered encapsulated. Now, one of the things that you're going to see is Docker Engine versus Docker Desktop. Docker Engine is how we are going to actually create the containers, and this is done at the command line. Docker Desktop actually gives us GUI options and brings Docker to places besides Linux in a slightly more accessible way. This is the Docker Desktop, the one that they've been moving to having to pay for for corporate usage. Now, Docker for pre-built containers, which means somebody else has already made the little box that we want to copy, is actually super easy to use. You can install Docker on Linux. It only takes a couple of commands. It's very straightforward. And then you run the command that the Docker image or Docker developer has given you. So you can see in this particular example, this is actually the Docker command to start ZoneBinder. Now, if you would like a little bit more information on this, um, if you go to my website, you can actually see my entire write-up of how to use and install ZoneBinder on uh, Docker, Kubernetes, or a Pi, but this is how you would install it. So that command. Now, that command looks really complicated, but that command was actually given as part of the instructions. So the only things that I had to change was the path. So you can see here that the, you know, Docker run, that's how we just say we want to start Docker. And then we can do things like change ports or, you know, time zones. In my case, I'm on the East Coast of the United States, so I use the New York time zone. And then you can see my path. Now, in this particular case, this is the path that I've chosen to put things in. That is going to change based off of your computer because your name is very unlikely to be a Holden Gobert. So you would be able to make those changes, but those small changes is all you would have to do, and then you'll have your container running. So that actually makes it really nice to be able to use and share with others because it's a much more straightforward, and I wouldn't necessarily say easy, but easier way to set up applications than the way that we used to have to do it. Now, if you'd like to do an activity, docker-curriculum.com has an activity and some tutorials, and I would recommend that you go and try this. One of the best ways to start learning to work with containers is try it and see what happens and see, you know, sort of what issues you run into and how to fix them. So I would recommend you go run through this tutorial and pause me and then come back. Now, now that we've talked about Docker. Remember, Docker is how we are going to have the recipe for building our boxes. And then we are going to have to go through and build those boxes by running that command. That's how we say, you know, hey, I'd like to go get a copy of your box and I would like it to run here on my machine. Container management is actually if we wanted to, or container orchestration, is how we manage lots and lots of boxes. So you can see with Docker, I'm able to create these really nice images of the containers and I'm able to run that command. Now, that works if I am running singular commands. I would like a single instance of ZoneMinder, an instance being a copy of that box on my machine. So if I want a single instance of that, or I want a single instance of Home Assistant, or a single instance of Apache, well, that's not a big deal. I can run that command. I'll have to run three commands. You know, whatever. It's fine. But let's say, however, I wanted to have this scaled. I want to have way more. I'm Google, and I would like to have a container every time somebody runs a search. Now, 
As I'm sure you know, every time somebody runs a search in Google, we really can't have a person sitting there typing all of that in and then hitting enter. There is literally not enough time in the universe for that. So instead, what we want to do is find a way to automate that. So container orchestration engines are actually specifically used for these large scale deployments where we want to have lots and lots of containers, these little boxes, and we want to have somebody help us manage these containers. So instead of me going in and saying, okay, this box is going to go here and that box is going to go there. I can use container management or container orchestration software to do all that for me. So it can actually do things like health checks and load balancing. So what I mean by that is let's say I have my ship with all of the boxes on it. I need to make sure that all of the boxes are correctly balanced so that the ship doesn't oh, turn over. If I use orchestration software, it's kind of like having a little magic robot that does it for me. So I can just say, hey, little magic robot, could you please make sure that all of my containers are balanced on this ship correctly so that I don't have to worry about the ship tipping? And then the robot goes, yeah, sure, no problems. Let me go do that for you. And then whenever I add new boxes, the robot deals with it. And so instead of me having to say, oh, shoot, I really need to move this Apache box over there and this, um, you know, ZoneMinder box over here, the robot is just like, no, go put your feet up. I'll go handle it for you. Don't worry about it. I got this. So you can see how that would be a lot easier if we're talking about, you know, large scale deployments. The robot can also do things like go check to make sure that the box is still okay. Now, again, it's a robot. You have to give it some instructions, but it can be like, oh, this box actually got damaged. I'm really concerned about it. Let me just build a new one for you. And so the robot can actually do that. And instead of me going and checking and say, oh, this corner got crunched. I really got to go fix it. The robot's just like, oh, yeah, this corner got crunched. I fixed it. It's in my log. Don't worry about it. I got this handled. Now, the most popular option for container orchestration is Kubernetes. Um, I actually use Kubernetes at home. I am a big fan. There are other options. Um, Docker Swarm is popular because it's native to Docker. It's also a YAML-based deployment, but it doesn't do everything Kubernetes does. Um, Mesosphere is also popular-ish, um, and several you know, very large companies do use it, but we are going to focus on Kubernetes because that is currently one of the most popular orchestration softwares. So Kubernetes. Kubernetes is the sort of magic robot that I was talking about that does all of the box management for me. It is also referred to as K8. It is actually open source and it was started by Google and it's used as part of the container as a service. And it was actually used and developed by Google because of the way that they needed to be able to scale up their production. So Google, as I'm sure everybody knows, is a huge company with lots of things happening and lots of people using it every single second of every single day. And so the scalability problem is difficult for a lot of companies to manage. So having these sort of in-house solutions is not uncommon. So Google actually developed this so they would be able to deal with some of the issues that they have with all of the people using their services. Now, lots and lots of large companies actually also use Kubernetes because it's able to solve the scaling problem for them in really nice ways. Some examples of companies that actually use Kubernetes besides Google are Spotify, um, Bose, the speaker people, Capital One, you know, and credit card Comcast, which is, you know, internet and cable and stuff like that, eBay, IBM, Pinterest, even Pokemon Go. Um, and if you were interested in others, I actually linked to the case studies here so you can see the people, other people that use Kubernetes as well. It's currently the most popular option. Now, Kubernetes uses something called YAML, which we're going to talk about in a second. And they are going to use pods, which groups of containers to make a single service. We're going to talk about that in a second too. But the idea is Kubernetes is the way that we are able to manage all of these boxes, including creating the boxes and then working with the boxes later. 
Now, the easiest way to think about it is like Kubernetes is a magic robot that helps us build the boxes. So instead of building the boxes ourselves like Docker does, we ask the robot to build it for us. Magic robot will also help us manage our little boxes. Um, I call the little robot Mechie. I have created this AI based drawing of Mechie if you are interested. YAML is how we give instructions to our magic robot Meki. It's a human readable language. Uh, you'll also see it, YAML ain't markup language. It's very sort of similar to markup language, however, in that the way that you are writing out instructions is sort of a specific way so that you can say to the robot, you know, hey, could you please build me a container using this recipe and I would like to store it on this location. Docker is how we can build little boxes ourselves. Kubernetes is the magic robot that builds the boxes for us rather than us having to do it. In the case of Kubernetes, we basically just give it the recipe and, and we can actually have it point to Docker images. That's one of the things that makes it really awesome is it's not exactly different than Docker in that way. It can actually use all of the Docker images. So like if you have a Docker image of let's say Apache, the basic web server, you can either set up a Docker container with that web server, or you can explain to Kubernetes how you would like that container set up, still use the Docker container from the Docker hub, and then still get the web server. So it's actually really nice in that they work together like that. So it's not like you have to build something completely new. It's just a way to help you build your boxes faster. Now, with Kubernetes, we have nodes, the computer we're running Kubernetes on. Uh, if you are running this on a single server, you may just have a single node. The control plane, which is how we are managing little boxes. Pods, which is the wrapper around the box to protect it. A namespace, which is how we are isolating groups. Now, think of the namespace like the name of the ship. So if we have a ship filled with boxes, we would have, you know, the good ship smart home and all of the boxes that are on the good ship smart home are all a part of the namespace smart home. So it's one of the ways that we can actually sort of keep track of things together and we can have multiple different namespaces so we can have multiple different ships and they can all have different containers and it means that we can sort of organize all of the containers that we're using in different ways. YAML is how we are writing the recipes that the magic robot is following. So you can see to the right here, I actually have an example sample recipe. This is also linked um, on my website and this is actually freely available for you. I wrote this and you can go take this. Um, and if you go to the how to do virtualization in my smart home project, you can actually download this as well as many other uh, YAML example files. But basically what's happening is this YAML file is explaining that, you know, I would like to have this sample recipe for Apache. You can see where the image is actually Ubuntu slash Apache 2 colon 2.4 dash 22.84 underscore beta. Now, you don't really need to remember any of that. That's just, this is the image of where Apache lives. And so the Docker container that I want to pull, that's its location. And that's actually one of the things that's listed in the Docker command. So you can just copy and paste it over. Um, you can see the similarities. So if you look back at that Docker command that you saw in a previous slide, you can see where you're going to see the image in there. You can see where you're going to see the paths in there. You can see where you see the port. You can also see things like something as simple as the time zone. And you can see my comment here. This is where you change the time zone. This is where you put in the image. Um, you know, making sure to update the name in the namespace if you're doing a different one. So I've made notes of the things that you may want to change.
So um, in this particular case, it's samplerecipe.yaml, um, and you can see that it's in the namespace Smart Home, so the Good Chip Smart Home. And basically everywhere that I have the name or the app, I'm just keeping it to a nice simple sample recipe. And you can make this more complicated if you would like to. I have some examples of more complex ones that you're more than welcome to download and start playing with. Um, but you can see that that's the recipe for how the magic robot is going to make our box. And this has the instructions for how we would like our box taken care of. And there's lots of different ways that we can give instructions and other instructions we can give. This is just a relatively basic one. Now, after we've told our magic robot that we would like to, you know, have our container started up and everything, we want to be able to interact with our magic robot and interact with our good ship smart home. So we can actually use something called cube control. It's also referred to pretty frequently as cube cuddle. Um, and cube cuddle is how we can interact with our Kubernetes cluster from anywhere. So let's say we have a home server and on that home server we have Kubernetes installed and we have the good chip smart home. And I would like to interact with the good chip smart home from my laptop which is a different computer than my server. What I would actually be able to do is install kubectl on my laptop and then I would be able to have my laptop interact with the good chip smart home. And so I can give it different instructions or I can change the instructions. So I can say, you know, actually, I don't really want Apache. Um, you know, it turns out I want Home Assistant. Um, and then I can write the instructions, the recipe for how to make Home Assistant. And I can do all of that from my laptop. I don't even have to go in to my server. Like I, I literally don't even have to SSH into my server. As long as I'm on the same network, I can just say, you know, hey, by the way, little robot, could you please do this thing for me? And cube cuddle is how I'm saying, could you please do this thing for me? And then the robot goes, oh yeah, sure, no problem. So to use cube cuddle, it is again, relatively straightforward. You install it on in your machine. Now, if you're in Linux, it's you know gonna be a sudo apt install or sudo yum install or whatever it happens to be. If you're on Windows, you might have to do it a little differently. They have some documentation on how to do it. It's still pretty straightforward. You'll create a folder on your machine. So, you know, a folder cube, Kubernetes or whatever. And then that's where you put all of your YAML files. You make a YAML file for every namespace that you want. So every time you want to create a new ship, you create a YAML file. That's basically the instructions on how to build that ship. Then you create separate YAML files that are the instructions on how to build each of the boxes that you want to be on that ship. And then literally you can just say, you know, cube cuddle, um, apply dash F sample recipe dot YAML. And then that's the equivalent of saying, hey, Mecky, my magic robot, could you please go make a box for me following this recipe? And because the recipe has the instructions for the box and the location of the ship that I want the box to go on, it actually does all that for me in usually less than a couple of minutes, um, usually less than a few seconds, actually. Now, if you would like more explanation and a more deep dive into exactly how KubeCuddle works and what it looks like, um, if you go to my Smart Home project, I actually have a whole page on virtualization set up on a server with how to install Docker, Kubernetes, and also how to use KubeCuddle. It's relatively straightforward um, and it's worth sort of learning how to do because it's actually really cool and it's pretty awesome that you're able to set up all of these containers relatively simply compared to what it used to be. And yes, I know I'm doing the, you know, sort of I used to walk uphill to school both ways in the snow thing, but trust me when I say that this is so much better than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. We no longer have to walk up hill both ways in the snow. It's like kind of downhill, no snow. Um, so for the activity, I included uh, Kubernetes documentation with tutorials. I actually have a really nice tutorial 
And on the virtualization setup, um, I have some instructions on how to go do this. So I would say go try and install an Apache container. Try it on Docker or Kubernetes. There's instructions on my website. There's a bunch of other people that also do great instructions for some of the basics. Um, I've included the sample YAML recipe so that you can go try that. But seriously, just go try it. See what happens. See how the install goes. Um, you know, if you already have a server set up, awesome. If you don't, I actually have some instructions on how to set one up. You can just take any old computer and go try it. And I absolutely recommend that you take a minute and go do that. Now, the last thing that I do want to talk about here is Kubernetes vulnerabilities. Kubernetes is awesome. I'm actually a huge fan. I think it's great. Um, and I really like that, you know, we've sort of gotten to the place that we can use this now. But Kubernetes is not the most straightforward thing when you get into some of the more complex things that you can do with it. So a simple something that you're doing at home that isn't available to the public, play with it. There's not really that much that can go wrong. But if you're doing things that are more complex, Kubernetes can be very difficult to configure well enough that you aren't leaving holes. It is a new enough technology that people are still absolutely figuring out all of the things that it needs and all of the ways to do it and all of the things that they have to say. So services like Shodan actually make it really easy to find attack planes. And it's not necessarily the, once you get into some of the more complex use cases on Kubernetes, it's not always the most well-documented thing. So it's not like somebody's gonna say, oh, by the way, don't forget to do this. It's, it's not sort of, enough for that yet. Um, for example, Tesla actually exposed part of their dashboard for their main Kubernetes API to the entire internet without authentication, totally by accident. So this was a misconfiguration in Kubernetes. And that's actually a very common thing to have happen. Um, and this is very, very smart people at very, very well known, popular, big companies making these mistakes. And unfortunately, a compromised container is a compromised cluster. Uh, if you are a Terry Pratchett fan, I will leave you with the thought that it's just turtles all the way down. So I hope you enjoyed my talk on containers. I very much hope that you go try and use a container. They are so cool. And I hope everybody has a lovely day.